we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, for you alone are our rock and our fortress. Amen. Text for meditation and the lessons for this day, but especially the words of the psalm. I will listen to what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, his saints but let them not return to follow. I don't know about you, but uh, memory sometimes can be a challenge. My wife calls me and wants me to stop at the store, which is a block away from the church, and bring something home. And more often than not, I just drive home and forget all about it. I, of course, am the only husband in this room who has ever done this thing, but I am guilty. The crazy thing, though, is I can remember the text from the first sermon I ever preached. I will speak, I will listen to what God the Lord will say, for he speaks people to, peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. First time I ever preached was at Concordia College Ann Arbor, where I went. And they had the tradition of every morning there was chapel led by a professor. And on Wednesday nights, everybody got dressed up. It was a big occasion. They got dressed up and went down for chapel. And one of the guys who was a senior got a turn to preach that evening. Now, as you've all figured out, I'm a little bit of a Weisenheimer. That's a technical term if you don't know this. A Weisenheimer, and the text I chose was actually in front of everybody. So in that chapel, which was huge, underneath here wasn't a, a cross like that, but underneath there was engraved in marble. I will listen to what God the Lord will speak, for he speaks peace to his people, his saints. Isn't that a great thing to have there? To say that church is always about God bringing peace to his people. The peace that comes from knowing that God is not angry with us. Whether we get eight tenths of an inch of rain, or I heard some people around here got six inches, and hail. It has nothing to do with God's anger. It has all been taken away in Christ Jesus. Who, of course, when he walked into the room on that Easter evening said, of course, on that evening he said, Peace to you. He did not say, where were you this morning? I told you I was going to rise from the dead. Why weren't you there? He did not say, where were you on Friday? Why were you hiding in fear? Why weren't you with me in the hour I needed you? He didn't do any of that. He simply walked in and said, peace. God's message, if you want to put it in one word, could be peace. You could use other words. You could use love hope or Jesus, but one word to speak about what God has said is peace. Sins are forgiven. God is not angry with us. And because we have peace, then sometimes he's able to quiet our hearts and take away that worry and take away our guilt. He's actually able to do it always, but sometimes we want to hold on to these things and give us Peace. On a morning when it's 60 degrees out and the heat isn't as bad as it was. And all you want to do is just go sit outside and have a drink of water. Or maybe some of you drink that burnt water they call coffee, I think. Or whatever it is that you want to do. And you just want to sit there and enjoy and look out and say, isn't this wonderful? For today I had the privilege of being up on the hills seeing some shut-ins and coming down out of those hills and just seeing the fertile land that is green and growing and beautiful, and all you can think of is, is this wonderful? I've also been up in those hills when you came down that and you couldn't see 10 feet in front of you, and you wonder about that entirely different day. But on a day like today, you just say, isn't this good? Or as the psalmist said, yes, the Lord will give what is good in our land will yield its increase. 
So at the end of the sermon, after we talked about how God has brought us peace, that first sermon I got, did, I said, you know, just for you guys, so you won't forget what I said, I'll leave it up there. It's in marble, and it's etched, and hopefully they'll continue to remember it. Many years after that, I was called, I was at a place called Wolsey, South Dakota, and I also served Westington, and I got a call to a place called Brookings, to a little tiny group of people, and the name of that church was Peace. Now, earlier in my life, I had been warned, never take a call to Peace Lutheran Church. And why is that? Because they ain't got none. <laughs> that's, in fact, why they named it that, is because that's what they're hoping for. And this group had come out of some conflict, and it had some trouble, and they called themselves Peace, and I ended up being their first pastor. What was my job? My job was simply to proclaim the name of the church. Right? We have peace with God. Not because of who we are, not because of what we have accomplished, but because Jesus Christ has reconciled us to God by taking away all of our sins from us. If you want to talk about that process, read that second letter again for today, which actually in the original is two sentences. It just keeps going. Paul is so excited because God has chosen us, he's adopted us, he predestined us, he made us his children, he has given us everything, and we are his now and forevermore. And we have the blessing of God's presence, the blessing of peace because of what God has done. He came and changed things. So not only is there peace this way, and not only can there be peace here, but there is peace this way. Right? A wife can forgive her husband whose memory isn't all that good. A husband can forgive a wife, well, she doesn't sin, so it's not really much of an issue here. And I will continue to say that. Whether she's in the room or not, I will continue to say that, because I think I need a lot more than she ever does. We can forgive each other. As members of the body of Christ, we can forgive each other because of what is God has done for us, because he has brought us what we need more than anything, and that's peace. But he's not only brought it to us, he's brought it to people in tough situations. The lady and whose family lived in this town, she made her living in a way that is not the best. She... Uh, lied one day. She was guilty of treason. And yet, she did it all because she was afraid. Not of the king, and not of the soldiers of the king, but she was afraid of God. Our hearts have melted as we have heard all that is happening out there. How you destroyed Sihon and Og. How you guys left Egypt and now come through on dry land how everything has happened, and we are afraid because I know who you people are. You're the people who have the Almighty God, the one who's in charge of heaven and the one who's in charge of earth. What is it she wants? She wants her fear to be gone. She wants peace. And on top of that, she wants security. So she says to the guys, "When if I take care of you, you better take care of me. And if you remember the rest of the story, which we'll get to in a few weeks, she ties a cord in her window, and all of Jericho is destroyed, except her and her family. What is it she needs? She needs to know that God loves her. She needs to know that he will not destroy, that the anger that is righteous God will not harm her. There's another guy in our lessons for today, a guy who's looking for exactly the same thing. This guy so doesn't get on his knees and say, I'm sorry, Lord. This guy doesn't, doesn't do what is appropriate, doesn't do what is proper. He does something that is really rash after he has had too much fun on his birthday, perhaps has drank too much stuff, perhaps is only caring about all those people there 
He knows the truth. He knows that John is from God. He knows that he's speaking from God, but he allows his own vows. He allows his own sin to take over. And he does something horrible. And you know, you read that lesson up front, and you talk about a platter, and you just get sick to your stomach, right? Do you even think that this is possible, that somebody could do such a horrible thing? And that they think that it is a good idea. We're having a party, and what do they do? They bring in a head. This is beyond comprehension. But he only did it because he messed up and made a promise that he shouldn't have made. A little later, he hears that Jesus is wandering around. That Jesus has sent his disciples out. That people are getting healed. That they're feeding of multitudes. That he's taking care of them. And he's preaching the kingdom of God. Repent for the kingdom is at hand. His uh, people that are around him say, this must be Elijah. This must be prophet. This must be him. Somebody like that. But all the man can say is, this is John, whom I'm beheaded. He has been raised. Can you imagine his guilt at that point? His fear of what's going to happen to him? What is it that Herod needs? Herod needs somebody to tell him that Jesus loves him and forgives him. But Herod never believes the message. In fact, right before Jesus is about to die, Herod sees Jesus face to face. And what does Herod ask for at that point? Does he ask for forgiveness? Does he ask for God to be with him? I did a terrible thing one day. I am really sorry for all I've done. Please forgive me. No, what does he ask for? Vegas, baby. I want some sort of magician show here. I want the biggest show we've ever had. And I hear you can do it. Let's have some fun. Let's continue to party. What is it that people need? Whether your name is Herod, who did a horrible thing, or your name is Rahab, or your name is... What is it that we need? I will listen to what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, his saints. Surely his salvation is near to those who love him, that glory may dwell in our land. We need not to hear that it's a beautiful day. We need not to know that the weather forecast says this. We need not any of that. What do we really need? We need peace. That our sins are forgiven. That God is not angry. That he has sent his son poured out his anger on him, so he might be his people. That God is not frustrated with us. That God is never upset with us. That God loves us so much that he wants us to be with him forevermore. Today I was visiting somebody and we're having a discussion about what does it mean to be a grandparent. I got this one down. It means that when my grandson comes to my house, there are no rules. Because grandpa and grandson do not believe in these things. There is only acceptance. There is only love and compassion. There is only somebody I know that cares about me. And it is not my problem to discipline him. That was the problem I had with his parent. Who I don't even try to do that anymore. That's not a good idea. What is God like? He's called our Father because He's supposed to be the one that anybody can come and talk to at any time. Sometimes, though, we have trouble with that. Maybe He's our grandfather. What is it that He says to us? I don't care what you've done, I don't care who you are. 
I don't care what you've been through. All I want you to know is one word, and that word is... Well, let's try that again. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've been through. All I want you to know is one word, and that word is... Peace. Oh, we got it, right? Because what's God's message? Wouldn't it be great if it was engraved up here? That every preacher ever, whoever comes, would always remember that it's always about one word. It's about Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He walks in the room always and says, Peace. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. For he speaks peace to his people with his saints. We give all thanks and praise to our God. That we didn't have to create peace. That we didn't have to do anything to bring it about. Because we'd have messed it up. We give all thanks and praise to him because we have peace in Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay, now what comes next? And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen.